The Tom Woods Show, episode 914. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, chances are in your Facebook feed you've got people telling you that you want children to die because you oppose Obamacare. Why, don't you know it saves 36,000 lives per year? Smash all this nonsense with my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Health Care. Pick it up at yourfriendsarewrong.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Fresh from Seattle, by the way, where we had a great time. I did two escape rooms with supporting listeners. We succeeded in the first one, the zombie room. Did not succeed in the second one, but had a great time in both cases. And my thanks to everybody who turned out for that. What else am I going to say? The episode of Contra Krugman, my sister podcast that I do once a week with Bob Murphy, that we recorded live in Seattle, should be up and available within the next couple of days just because the Mises Institute has the audio and we got to get it from them and take care of it. So that episode's a little late, unavoidably so, under the circumstances. But uh, that's that. I'll be speaking in Orlando this coming weekend as part of the Republican Liberty Caucus National Convention. So you can uh, find out details about that at TomWoods.com slash events. And finally, I will have details coming this week for you about my 1,000th episode event in Orlando in September, September 9th. I'll have a special dinner for all the supporting listeners, and then we will have our live 1,000th episode event emceed by our friend Eric July. All right. Today I am talking to Kristaps Andresons, who is the host of of The Eastern Border, which is a podcast where you can learn a lot of Soviet and Eastern European history. It's tremendous. I've looked into it myself. A listener recommended it, and it's wonderful, and I I think you would enjoy it very much yourselves. And I thought I would have him on to ask some rapid-fire questions about Soviet history. And we're going to do a bit of a gallop through Soviet history in this all-too-brief episode just to tantalize you until you have an opportunity to listen to the Eastern Border. Chris, welcome to the show. Greetings, comrade. <laughs> you know, there's there are so many topics we could cover, and I finally decided I don't know if I can or even want to narrow them down for at least this first time that, that you're on. I just want to ask you some things that interest me oh, sure. about the history of Eastern Europe and, and, and Soviet history in particular. So let me let me raise one with you that became fashionable in the West in some circles, certainly in communist sympathizing circles. It's the good Lenin, bad Stalin myth. In fact, my own professor of Russian history, Vladimir Brovkin, said that this drove him crazy, that there were people who believed that Lenin was basically a good guy, and then Stalin came along and corrupted everything. How would you respond to that? Oh, well, I'm, I'm doing actually my, my new episodes are on the Russian Revolution, which is all about Lenin. And I started to look at Lenin since his very birth and I looked at his family history and everything. And Lenin, well, I don't know, <laughs> Lenin started the massive terror. He was one of the institutors of war communism. He ordered like he personally wrote orders so that hundreds and thousands of kulaks would be hanged in public or or, or so that everyone would be afraid and would just collaborate lenin was just as bloodthirsty as, as stalin it's just that they had other other political conflicts lay when when late in lenin's life but yeah lenin lenin was just as ruthless murderer as stalin was there there are no good good lenin bad stalin thing going on here and trotsky also was just as evil as as these two so it was it was kind of weird, but during that revolution, I have to say Nicholas II was also not a nice guy, and uh, yeah, for the most part, everyone who was involved with the communist revolution were um, were basic. It was basically a um, black versus uh, all-consuming void of darkness kind of conflict. Not even black versus gray. Right, right, right. Of course, of course. Now, but on the other hand, let's go back for a minute here to um, well, I don't know. I think. I think you could probably make a better case for Nicholas II, but I'm not here to do that. Slightly, but he still he still used cannons to shoot at, at peaceful protesters of his own people who were just coming 
for him asking for help because Russia has this stereotype over there. Whenever something goes wrong in Russia, and this happens up to, to this day, a lot of people treat it as like we have this good czar daddy up there, and then every, everyone. Oh right, no, I get that. Everyone else, it's it's just the fault of the bureaucracy that's a, that's at fault. So the czar at the beginning was kind of the good person who didn't know anything, and and like he he the, the ordinary peasants just went went for a petition for the, to the czar to improve their, their situation in life, and then, then the czar just decided to shoot them with cannon. Right, and there's absolutely no defending that. Yet I feel like I would rather have lived under him if I had to choose, because I think the possibility that I would be arbitrarily killed was infinitely small. Whereas under Stalin, I could be arbitrarily killed. There would be no reason. And in fact, that was part of the, the merits of the terror from his point of view, was precisely to terrorize the general public. And and that's one of the ways people distinguish Lenin from Stalin. They'll say, it's, it's sure Lenin may have, may have killed some people, but he didn't go and kill communists. He didn't kill his truly his own. So at least there were some limits, whereas Stalin had everybody living, uh, living in terror. Yeah, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's still mass murder of, of people. And Lenin just Lenin instituted the, the very first, very early stage of all of this, and um, he just stopped, basically starved people to death. He started all this idea of just taking grain from the people, complete and total control of the uh, of the state over everything that's going on, and and that was terrible. And one of the one of the early things that Lenin actually started as as he was there when Cheka was founded, which later became KGB, was that he began instituting this uh, denunciation mechanism. Essentially, you know, everyone was welcome to just write secret letters to the secret police telling that, you know, my neighbors, they have they have saved up some, some gold from the old days and they're not giving it to the government so that, you know, the Czech would arrive, take, other, take those other guys away and probably, you know, you could live in their apartment or whatever. So it was it was also not only this this fear of being sent to gulags or executed or all of this. It was also the fear of of mistrust towards your own neighbors at all time. And this was or this was like created on purpose. They tried the the Soviet government since the creation of Cheka, which Lenin did, always tried to make sure that everyone mistrusts each other so that there could be no, you know, no very organized resistance towards this so that you would be afraid of your neighbors as much as you would be afraid of, of the government. Well, you were mentioning agriculture and taking grain away. Let's talk about the best known example of that, the Ukrainian terror famine of uh, 1932 to 3. There you do get from time to time people, certainly in the West, who will say that this has really been exaggerated or that there really was no actual plan to starve these people or this is just propaganda meant to put the Soviet Union in a bad light. Now, you can still hear people to this day saying that. Is there any truth to that whatsoever? Yeah, I, I actually argued about this on the internet a few days ago because uh, some listeners just look at my look at my logo and decide that I'm very pro-communist, and then they add me to various Facebook groups, and I got added added to this Facebook group where there were people with exactly this argument. And and when you look at the pictures, when you look at the, all the documentation, it, it is ridiculous because see, Ukraine uh, Ukraine has one of the more fertile it's one of the more fertile places on the planet, and that's where. That's where, like, most of the grain was 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 grown also in the Russian Empire. So what Stalin did was he needed money for industrialization, and he had also spent like a huge gold reserves on it already. So what he did was that he chose this region where most grain was produced and just confiscated it all and sold it off to Americans. No, seriously, your 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 country were the most like uh, the top buyers of of this grain from Stalin. But I think there's there's more than that though because he he there's also some there's also some racial hatred yes yeah he wants to tar why why does he want to target the Ukrainians in particular because uh, he all, he personally thought that they were among the <clears throat> least uh, trustworthy Soviet citizens he even though he himself was a Georgian he became extremely extremely Russian supremacist at one point. And and it happened like in Ukraine he th he thought that you know these are fertile lands we might use them later, and that Ukrainians are the most likely peoples who could like rebel in mass against the Soviets, but he did that to all sorts of minorities in the Soviet Union. For example, Latvians, Lithuanians, and Estonians were often just sent to gulags in in this in when when we were occupied by the Soviet Union with, with like our our crime 
are like uh, you know when, when you have to fill out fill in the blanks and you know the crime was just stated Latvian. Boof, off to Gulag you go. It was just you know trying trying to Russify everything. We call this process here Russification, the elimination of the local minorities and like introducing uh, the Russian colonial kind of R Russian people get settled here forcibly as well and they get incentives to move to these regions as to ensure that no no region of the Soviet Union would have like a non-Russian majority so that everywhere you know, throughout the Soviet Union Russians would be the majority. That would happen there as well. So Stalin had to exterminate Ukrainians so that the Russians would remain as, as a huge, at least a huge minority. In the best case is he held a majority in that region and thus he believed the, that it would be easier to control. I don't know how far his books spread, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with a British historian named Robert Conquest, who wrote a lot of books about Soviet crimes. And he wrote in particular a book called Harvest of Sorrow about the Ukrainian terror famine that I always recommend to people because it, it it's it's like you're reading a work of fiction. You, you can't believe these things happened. And it does seem to be pretty well documented to me. But Conquest also wrote a major work on the Great Terror. And I'd like to get into what the terror was all about, but first I'm curious about the opening of the Soviet archives. There seem to be different opinions on what we found there, because some people say we open the archives and it turns out the crimes were even more scarlet than we realized, and others say we open the archives and it turns out we had exaggerated the extent of the crimes. What did the opening of the archives really tell us? Uh, you mean you mean the archives in Moscow? Yes. Well, the archives in Moscow told exactly what the people opening them wanted them to say, because uh, the biggest problem with studying Soviet era, history in general, is that a lot of the documents written by in, in the Soviet era by Soviet authors, Soviet historians, like, you know, everyday newspapers, everyday documents written by clerks, they contain falsehoods themselves, okay? So that's the issue. The government blatantly used misinformation, and and a lot of this stuff is very unreliable. And you, for me, that's that's the biggest difficulty when I when I do when I do my Eastern Border show, that I have to triple check everything. I have to rely not only on these sources but on the opinions of these sources because, well, for example, the Russia Russia these days has tendency to only uh, all the archives even haven't been opened yet for starters. Uh, so the parts that have been opened are obviously thought by Russian experts today as, you know, as being okay to open. So there is still stuff that we don't know about. And there's also the stuff about the Soviet archives, like, you know, uh, these KGB collaborator lists, like people who were kind of the secret agents of the KGB, but, you know, just who, who worked with the KGB, who were these denouncers. Uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russian military took took a lot of these lists away away with them as well. And that has also caused a lot of suspicion. I don't know. The, any, any time you, you read something from the archives, you really have to look at multiple sources at a difficult difficult process ahead of you. Because you have to really sift through and understand what's a falsity and what's a fact. And, and, and how, how all of this process of researching that will go. Well, let's talk about a, a, another uh, of the crimes that Robert Conquest wrote about. And that's the, the Great Terror of the 1930s, which, if I'm remembering correctly, originated because of uh, allegedly a plot against Stalin. And, of course, now this gives him free reign to go out against the saboteurs and, and to accuse people of being involved in it. But it was it extended into the Communist Party itself. It extended across the country. And the figures that are given for the the people who were victims of the terror are almost impossible to believe they're so extensive uh, in well into the millions give me the background here how, how and and how this could have happened see stalin or you know stalin was his nickname his previous nickname by the way was koba he used to go to the he used to go to an orthodox seminary yeah. but then he started reading marxism there and then he decided to become an atheist and then he started robbing banks to finance the bolsheviks but uh, essentially by that by this point in 1937 why this happened was that he had a power struggle in the communist communist party and lenin before his death even wrote specifically that he does not want to see stalin like becoming becoming uh, kind of this this his follower and how Stalin rose to power also is interesting because the party elected him to be the general secretary and instead of uh, and Stalin instead of you know 
moving to a position like previously they had what uh, they, they had president they had chairman of the party whatever but we all know from the Soviet history the general secretary is the top position there well Stalin made it the top position it was just a secretarial like technically when became when he became the general secretary he was basically the top clerk of the country but who was responsible for putting his people everywhere like he was the guy who assigned all the mid-level bureaucrats and everything and then he made it the top position and he was so angry about the fact that nobody liked him and nobody supported him and, and so well then he just decided to ruthlessly exterminate any political threats that he might have and just uh, you know deal with the old guard of, of Lenin's so to speak so that he would rule alone with with his superior clique of, of I don't know <laughs> clique of lackeys I would state yeah probably <laughs> and and with the rest of the country well he had to do these things because of industrialization as Stalin well we, we must look at Stalin in, in two two periods really Stalin before World War two and Stalin after after World War two and, uh, and uh, Stalin before World War two really never stopped thinking about this world revolution that's why he kind of piled up with Hitler briefly and and that that's why they they uh, conquered Poland together and, and that's why he started the winter war Stalin was going for the world revolution he was he was kind of a supporter of this idea a supporter of, of this expansion so that the Soviet system could grow grow stronger and and he would kind of be able to rule over more and he just understood that if uh, some form of tot totalitarian uh, rule isn't established in the USSR they would just eventually collapse because people would just you know run away from it, for, from it or just see it see see it for what it really was which was essentially uh, a ginormous prison for all the people involved except those on the very top he just did it to consolidate power i think i could speak about why and how stalin did all these things for like 8 hours right now but as far as i get it we don't have that much that much time so this is my very short concise answer well but i guess what i want to know is we hear these stories of people getting this knock on the door in the middle of the night and then we never see them again. But that seems like an incredibly inefficient and slow way to displace millions of people. It seems oh, no, no. hard to imagine. You know, so what, what actually happened? No, no, th that only happened in the cities, you see. That happened in the cities and that was the job of the secret police. If you ever visit Latvia, we have a KGB museum here. Like, it's open to the public now and you get a tour through the torture chambers and the prison and everything. That only happened in the cities. Uh, the organized mass deportations and shootings happened in a way that... Well, at least here in the Baltics, we we had two of the we have two of these. One in the 1940, one in the 1949, and it's just basically the army arrives at, at the town, gives an order to the mayor of the town, give me 1,000 unworthy, untrustable elements from this from this place, and it doesn't matter who they are. Just you have to come up with a list of exactly if you have 997 people who would be probably criminal you just have to add three more in because otherwise you'll get sent away so you know there's a quota on how many people need to be sent out or exterminated from each of each of like the administrative districts then they're all gathered in one spot blade uh, just just stuffed into stuffed into these these huge trains like in the wagons where cattle used to be transported throughout the Soviet Union yeah you just get thrown into these without any heating or anything just you know you just get thrown into these and then you just get de deported to siberia for to gulags it was very it was a very industrial form of killing it was just simple and oh and those who died on the way there yeah they were just thrown out and you know now, well now that makes me curious about I, I of course i want to ask you about latvia in particular the latvian soviet socialist republic is established in 1940 how is the average person's life different after that? Um, Forty percent of Latvians die. And how exactly? Tell me. Well, you see, this the, the whole establishment of Latvian, and the same thing happened in Estonia and Lithuania and many other places. Oh, most recently in Crimea. <clears throat> but yeah, what what happens is very simple. The the Soviet Union just comes up to your borders and says, "Hey." We will invade you if you do not comply with our ultimatum to have an army base in your territory. So our government says, well, okay, we should trust the Soviets. Let's allow them to have an army base. 
Three days later, the Soviet government sends, oh, well, <clears throat> you tricked us somehow and something happened to our army base. I don't know. We now have a pretext. We shall now, you know, we shall now come in with our army and <clears throat> overthrow your radical, crazy government, which obviously does not respect international treaties and create a nice, fair election. Uh, we have all the candidates on this list already. Our tanks uh, will be on the streets while you go and vote. And yeah, the voting is abs absolutely not pri not private. Voting has to be public. And, and you know, Know, there's a there's a guy there are guys from KGB staring at how you vote very fair election basically uh, and after that after that it was it was simple the denationalization started the the, the the nationalization started basically so the soviet army like soviet army officials just come to your place and say that you know you live you you live too you're, you're just too well off then they just confiscate everything that they want and sometimes leave you alone Sometimes just arrest some members of your family because the list of crimes for whom you can be arrested is is crazy. Like you could get arrested in Soviet, era, like even in the 1940, just as they just as they occupied us. Imagine this: you're you're you, one day you live in Latvia, next day you live in Soviet Latvia, and apparently you can now go to prison for 10 years for having the flag of your old country still in your place somewhere, not even waving around. Okay. So essentially, they went went around and, and took everything they could from the people, gave it to the army, and, and decided to just populate this whole region and stuff. It was just a lot of people died, and you know, it was it was we call it the dreadful year, the dreadful summer basically. It's a, it's a massive tragedy here, as the Soviets essentially, because of their army, just started confiscating everything they wanted and started just putting people in prison, shipping them off to gulags, whatever. Just so someone's house was nice. So, you know, this Soviet officer decided that he would like to live in this house. What do you do? Well, you just have to murder everyone who lived there previously. Now, I assume things become at least somewhat more normal after the war is over? After Stalin's death, yes. Well, after, after Stalin's death in 1953. The, then things started to become your usual stagnation and like it wasn't so much of uh, direct terror and being afraid of being shot. Uh, the kind of the the Khrushchev already thought to normalize his relations with with the outside world in a way, and 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 he he kind of thought that you know St Stalin just just was a bit a bit too excessive in his mass murders of people. Yeah, wh why do you think Khrushchev gave the anti-Stalin speech in 1956? What did he stand to gain from that? Political power, because uh, Khrushchev wasn't al also already the imminent leader of the USSR after after Stalin went away, after Stalin died. Uh, he had to he had to basically basically wage an internal political war versus Zhukov, the famous general from World War II, as you see, Marshal Zhukov actually. And then there was also Beria, who happened. Be Beria was also one of these one of these guys who could have been the leaders, and there were some other minor figures there. And Zhukov, the general, he was a tough hardliner Stalinist. And then there were also some some other kind of more liberal guys who wanted to go back to the like the new economic policy which the Soviets had. They had limited capitalism from 1921 to 1928. And there were some guys some guys who wanted to move the country in that direction. So Khrushchev came in as a sort of a middle ground candidate who managed who who basically used these anti-Stalin tricks. To gain political political power and and just gain more votes in the in the kind of the the conference of the political of the communist party's central committee meetings, but at the same time he also did this so that his own crimes weren't being, weren't investigated because during Stalin's era and and at this at this point only only these people who were placed in power by Stalin were running the country. During Stalin's era, Khrushchev was was in Ukraine. He was the chief. He was the chief of the of Ukraine, essentially Ukrainian highest party official. So he was directly involved in in Holodomor. He was directly involved in the terror that happened in Ukraine and the nationalization there. And and he has signed orders of you know mass killings himself. And you know and, and by kind of citing stepping aside from Stalin. And so did the others did. Essentially, their excuse was, oh, I don't know what I was signing. I just signed these orders because I was, because I was afraid Stalin would kill me and stuff like that. So they just sort of, I don't know, cleansed their own consciousness and then tried to pretend to the rest of the people that they had nothing to do with, with all this, all these crimes that had been going on. Well, of course, they had been, they had been playing major roles in them. 
Well, now to complete our incredibly rapid gallop through Soviet history, let's talk about the one of the most interesting topics of all, which is how it all came to an end. What do you think the contributing factors were? Jeans and rock and roll, man. So it, it so it was that. It, it it was exactly that, and I've I'm, I've got I've got a bunch of episodes on this because uh, this is how the show started. But you see, uh, my dad, my dad, uh, he used to play bass in the opera orchestra for twenty years. But you know, as a young student, he wanted to get an electric guitar, and he had to build one on his own because they they you could just couldn't get them there. But so you know, there there was always a huge black market for everything. And, and like your average salary for an engineer was 120 rubles per month. That was kind of a higher up salary, like, you know, middle class salary, so to speak. A pair of jeans smuggled in from the U.S. cost about 200 rubles, which is over a monthly salary, obviously. And, and like everyone was making the craziest illegal stuff ever. I mean, and not and especially when it came to music, because not only illegal tapes were just circulating around. No, at one point. This was a bit early. This was already, I think, in the 70s. There was there was something called Rentgenizdat, which is like uh, when people dug through the garbage bins of uh, hospitals, looked looked looking for old Rentgen images, like used like Rentgen images just thrown out, you know, used used X-ray X-ray scans, and then they and they as they were mobile, they used to imprint vinyls on them, and they these were called bones. The, the the Soviet man was ingenious in the way how he basically smuggled in everything, and and we really really appreciated all the crazy stuff that we saw because uh, it became really apparent that you guys over there lived lived way better than we did here, and we wanted this how I like to call uh, the free we we like we like the taste of the freedom burger, you know. And it was really crazy. It was really expensive and 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 weird here because uh, my grandfather who who managed to become one of the he was one of the top engineers of, of Latvia. He managed to become kind of, uh, he never was in the party, but he managed to be, be quite high up. He once went to Japan with the Soviet delegation. He was included there. And he brought back from Japan to us a one small can of Coca-Cola, like this zero three liter can, the small can of Coca-Cola. And then he just invited every family member with him to his home. And then we kind of all got a small taste of, of, of Coke from, from shot glasses. And then, then he left the open Coke can on, on, on kind of on the shelf. And, and that was the luxury item. And everyone who came, came to visit him, but was just looking at this and was like, it was a, like a luxe symbol even. What about the role of Ronald Reagan? Because a lot of people in America think that Reagan played a role in pressuring the Soviets because of his strategic defense initiative, his so-called Star Wars plan. What do you make of that? Yeah, he's also responsible. I mean, we liked all this stuff, and, you know, at least in all the republics which weren't directly Russia, we were huge fans of Reagan. We were huge fans of America. We listened to uh, the Radio Free Europe and Voice of America all the time. Uh, and some some of us had relatives abroad who had escaped during World War II, and, and they also sent some materials in. And Reagan was viewed in a very positive light. He was viewed as the guy who finally, you know, finally pushes back to the Soviet Union, because... The Soviets uh, lived on their own self-image, basically. They had to always prove that they were the strongest and that they were the best. And a lot of people here believe, and although I also think so, that Reagan, that Reagan saw through the guise of, of this Soviet international bravado and really pushed on because he knew, as I think, that the Soviet Union just couldn't keep, keep up with the arms race and that the, our, our economy was just very stagnant and terrible. So I don't know. He he's seen as, as sort of the good guy here. What we whom we don't like, by the way, is uh, Harry Truman and FDR. We we don't like those presidents here at all. Huh. Interesting. Well, what what was the opinion of Gorbachev among the general public? See, even though he's gotten the Peace Prize, he's also one of the people who tried to institute prohibition in the Soviet Union. I didn't know that. I don't know how I didn't know that. Was was this a productivity measure? Yeah. He just he just uh, see he was a really truly idealistic communist and he he really looked at back at Stalin's era and thought and thought that you know well this this was wrong and that the but he essentially thought that communism could work and that people wanted the communism to work he just thought the bureaucracy uh, were just too selfish and that corruption was not uh, like a corruption was not a product of the socialist government that the production had come because of ineff ineffective leadership and all that 
Okay, so he honestly thought that by giving more liberties, he would kind of make sure make the people ha make people happier, and that he actually honestly thought that people wanted to live in the Soviet Union, which is crazy. He still committed a lot of crimes. I mean, uh, he's. He's the guy who ordered, like, you remember Chernobyl catastrophe, right, in 1986? Yeah, okay? of course, yeah. Gorbachev tried to really deny, uh, like, tried to deny anything, and he really tried to keep everything in control and stop people from panicking, and he only admitted it to the West when um, someone from Sweden had contacted him and asked him, hey, what's going on? The radiation levels are, are getting higher. And what he did personally... What he did personally, and he ordered that, you know, <clears throat> the communist uh, children's mass demonstrations and mass parties would be held uh, very near in the radiation zone next to Chernobyl and the other kind of centers centers of the region, in the, in the major towns, because he wanted to, to show in public to television that everything was okay, guys. And so he basically dragged the dragged like tens of thousands of kids of school kids to massively radiated areas and force them to just walk around and you know in these childhood communist party celebration meetings too and they did this and they did this just a day after after this happened he just really really tried to do this the sneaky way in the West, he was held in very very high regard so that's why I'm curious about what public opinion in his own country uh Believed about well, it, it was be it was better than anyone else uh, than anyone else we have had. But he was still a pretty much a criminal, and and who who really tried, like he irradiated tens of thousands of kids, you know, and 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 tried to and tr basically tried to fight the massive alcoholism problem in the Soviet Union. But basically, what he did was give a lot of money to organized crime, essentially, and to and to people who ju and people just started brewing their own moonshine moonshine at the same time he wasn't particularly effective he was better than anyone else but we still didn't like him right right yeah it's a uh, not much of a comparison i suppose so uh, tell me about your podcast the eastern border oh yeah um my podcast is, is we're almost two years now we're almost two years old now and essentially it's a podcast where i try to explain to to guys like you guys like guys in the west how it was really like in the soviet union and I not only just use historical sources, mind you, I, I try to use only sources in Russian or Latvian or like our regional sources, but I also, as a journalist, I have traveled around my region a lot and I have gathered a lot of private, deep, intimate stories about how it was like how it was like to live in, in the Soviet Union. Like all the crazy stories about how it was like to serve in the Red Army. And also during my own episode about Chernobyl, I interviewed a couple of people who were there, uh, sent there to kind of deal with the consequences and clean the place up. And, you know, I, I, I deal with all these very personal story, stories. My, one of my biggest influences is Dan Carlin. And, and I learned from him and I tried to Try to tell the story of my people. That's that's basically it. I also sometimes comment on modern day Russian politics too, which has led to me getting uh, a lot of angry emails and some death threats. Uh, and yeah, I just try to explain how it's really like here in this region, how it was, and that we weren't all fanatical communists, and that we we were like really, really, really hoping to get out of there, uh, if anything. And and what what struck me struck me really as odd was that. I listen to some other other podcasts out there, and and some of them kind of present their Russian experts. and And when I hear someone call the Russian expert like uh, this person had lived three months in Moscow and then six months in Saint Petersburg, which is completely unlike all the other parts of Russia, and probably you know in specially assigned hotels and and you know basically she saw only what she was supposed to see. And then they call such person an expert on Russia. Then I thought I had to tell the real story of my people, how it was, how it was like, how it is now. You know what's what's going on, so that you you would know that we are not all communist scum, so to speak. What's your website? TheEasternBorder.lv. But we can also be found anywhere where good podcasts are are found. Of course, of course. So people can go to iTunes, whatever. So we'll link to that on our show notes page, which I believe is going to be TomWoods.com slash nine fourteen. Well, this was uh this was. I'm sorry I put you through this crazy, this insane series of questions, jumping very quickly from one topic to the other. But I thought, first of all, it satisfies my curiosity on a, on a number of topics, but also it'll give people a sense of the the breadth of your podcast and the sorts of things people can learn. Uh, because I think people listening to this show would enjoy listening to your podcast. And um, I'm glad. I'll just say I don't I don't remember who it was who wrote to me to suggest that I have you on. But whoever you are, if you're listening, thank you for the suggestion. All right, did you want to say something? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that if my answers didn't make too much of a sense, it's like I had a limited time to answer this whole slew of things. Oh, everyone understands that. Everyone understands that what I was asking of you today was completely unreasonable. But I, I believe you passed the test uh, successfully. Well, and, and moreover, it's just enough to whet people's appetites, to get them to say, well, if I want to know more, I guess I'm just going to have to listen to the guy's podcast. So well, mission accomplished. <laughs> I'm, I'm very I'm very honored to be here. And uh, yeah, I just recently started listening to your, your show. I've listened only to a couple episodes for now, but uh, so far I really like it. And I, I will recommend it to my own listeners as well. But then again, you have way more listeners than I do. So I don't know how that'll work out. Well, who, who knows? Maybe, you know, you, I, I always refer to it as the Tom Woods show bump that people get. I hope you get a little bump from this because you're doing great, great, important work. And, and I appreciate your, uh, your time today. Thanks so much. Oh, also, I got to call you a comrade, which was fun on its own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one's ever done that before in over 900 episodes. That's the first time ever. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Thank you. And uh, have a great day. All right, that is our show for today. Now, if all goes well, tomorrow we're going to be talking about the whole monuments, southern monuments question here on the show. If you're enjoying the show, do please consider becoming a supporting listener over at supportinglisteners.com and joining the elite and getting the many, many benefits. And man, are there many benefits, uh, not the least of which is our secret Facebook group for all you good folks. All right, thanks for listening. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.